Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How wonderful to see so many of you here. Um, I'm Kate Moss. I'm a novelist, playwright, and a non-fiction writer. And it's my huge pleasure to be interviewing Sir Nicholas Heitner, who is the director of The Southbury Child, which is going to have its press night tomorrow night. Um, before we start, I mean, you know the deal here. We're going to talk as if you're not there. Um, there'll be time for a few questions. Um, and then you, we will scarper off in order to give the stage to the company. And now, before we start, who has already seen the show? And who's going in tonight? Oh, lot. Excellent. Do you want me to do the usual joke? Who hasn't got tickets yet? <laughs> no, you see me later. Um, that would be fine. Uh, good. Um, so uh, don't spoil it. Those of you who have seen it, don't ask an obvious question that might give anything away. Um, Nick, welcome back. You were last here in 1985 with Donald Sindon and a very young, promising actor called Alex Jennings. That's right. I believe. That's right. <laughs> Doing yeah. the Scarlet Pimpernel. The Scarlet Pimpernel, yeah. And it was, it was uh, 37 years ago. And Alex and I constantly bang on about 37 years ago to cast members who are a great deal younger than 37. <laughs> and see their eyes drooping with weariness. These two old men reminiscing. Um, and it, it was, it, yeah, it, well, time passes. It was the first big show in the theater. I'd done rep in Exeter and Leeds, and I'd done opera in London, but it was the first big show in the theater that I'd been asked to do because Donald Sindon had seen one of the operas that I'd did, done. He was an absolutely gorgeous man, Donald Sindon, just a wonderful actor and a man of extraordinary generosity and humor. Um, and the Scarlet Pimpernel was a kind of, to be honest, summer panto, which he absolutely went along with. Um, and, um, and it was, a, and yeah, Alex Jennings was, um, it, it, he was at the beginning of his career, as was I, and he was playing as cast in the season, which meant that he played anything that was thrown at him. He spent an awful lot of time in the vomitorians carrying spears in the Roman army for, <laughs> Julius C for Anthony Cleopatra, I think. But it's, uh, yes, he did. But the, I mean, I remember, um, seeing the Scarlet Pimpernel, and that beginning, hmm. the guillotine. Did yeah. anybody see it? Who, there, we, I, there you are, I knew that. I mean, yeah. that was extraordinary. Yeah, well, that was, that was a great prop. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was a guillotine that, uh, that apparently worked. <laughs> <laughs> ah. It didn't, it absolutely didn't. But it was, no, it was, that was, that was, what can you, can you guys build something that makes it genuinely look as if someone is getting their head chopped off? And they did. Well, they were days before health and safety, I imagine. <laughs> no, I think, it, I think it was pretty safe, actually. I think it was, I think it was, um, it was sleight of hand. Yeah. Later on, some um, 25, 30 years later, um, another young actor was, it was in the company. It was the Michael Grandage, who then became a director, <laughs> who then came to the National Theatre while I was in charge of the National and did a production, a much more serious play, Danton's Death. Um, by the German playwright uh, Buchner. Um, and blow me, the guillotine made a reappearance. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I've seen that before. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's brilliant. This is very good recycling. Anyway, we're here to talk about The Southbury Child, mm. which I saw a dress rehearsal and I loved it. I thought it was the most beautiful play. I'm a big fan of Stephen Beresford anyway, obviously last of the Housemans yeah. that you did at the National, but also many of you might have seen Pride. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about the genesis of the play, whether it was an idea of Stephen's, whether you just, you know, dreamed it up together and whether Alex was involved from the beginning. So just take us through how the combination of the three of you came together. Well, Stephen wrote a play called The Last of the Housemans, which was done at the National, I, I can't remember exactly when, uh, 10 years or so ago, with Julie Walters, Rory Kinnear and Helen McCrory. And it was one of the, my favorite plays yeah. at the National. I absolutely loved it. Um, and when, uh, with my colleague Nick Starr, we started to plan the Bridge Theatre in London, which we built and now run. I asked Stephen whether he would write us a play um, and asked him whether he had any ideas. And he then outlined this play. Mm. Uh, it's based on a real incident. Uh, and uh, it's set, although it's never said, it's set in Dartmouth, which is where Stephen's from, uh, uh, where he was brought up, where he often returns. Um, and so uh, he had the incident and he had the character that Alex plays, David Hyland, um, the vicar, 
uh, already fully formed. Mm -hmm. And it sounded fascinating to me. I, 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 um, it, and, and certainly about, a, about the church, but about a great deal more than the church. Um, I'm, I, I, um, I am neither from Devon, nor do I know Devon very well. Um, I'm Jewish and I'm a non-believer. Uh, so um, I thought Target I could, audience, I, could th I could I thought I could bring a useful outside eye. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things um, that I thought was so powerful, and, and and I I would like to know about how the script developed was this. The key question at the heart of it is, I, for me, was what is faith for, and how it operates within a community. Many of whom only will go on high days and feast days. Yes. Um, but at the same time, when there is a tragedy, often, or a moment of joy, yeah. a church in a small town, or even a big city, a small city like ours, is at the heart of it. So when you got the first draft, how much development has happened from Stephen's first idea of the play and what he talked about and what we're, we're seeing on the stage? Well, the basic idea has always remained the same, and 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 I don't. This isn't a spoiler because it it's um, it's in the description of the play uh, in the uh, repertoire leaflet, mm. and it also emerges in the first two or three minutes of the play. Um, what form should the funeral of a child take uh, when the request of the mother of the child is that the church should be festooned with Disney balloons? Uh, for the funeral, uh, say so that is a that is a not particularly old uh, dilemma that the vicar of a church in Dartmouth faced, mm. um, and the real vicar refused the balloons, um, and it became a big local scandal. Uh, so that has remained at the heart of the play, mm. but it's in it, it's what Alfred Hitchcock, Hitchcock used to call the MacGuffin. Uh, it remains the point at issue, but it's a, it, and it is a, a minor concern of the play. What form should a funeral take? How should death uh, be treated um, in a, in, within a religious institution? But it's the starting point for, first of all, the exploration of nine, I think, very vividly drawn characters, but also um, for wider questions about truth, principle, integrity, the degree to which um, any individual can hang on to their integrity in a world which inevitably involves compromise. I think this is a particularly current issue, actually. Yeah. Yeah. In public life, um, at what point does compromise uh, become uh, ill-doing? I think that's something that we're all looking at at the moment. <laughs> At what point does the sacrifice of integrity become uh, not kind, as many in the play, many of, in fact, everybody on stage in this play, um, apart from the vicar, uh, sees that his um, absolute determination uh, to refuse uh, balloons at the funeral for reasons that in his terms are absolutely rock solid. The rest of the characters think it's unkind. Compromise is kind. But at some point, compromise and the sacrifice of integrity um, lets down not only the individual who's making the sacrifice, but everybody around, mm. around that individual too. So that's, uh, it, it's those kind of things that the, um, that the play is looking at as well as at um, community a divided community, a community as uh, like so many small towns outside London um, is split between those who can live comfortably and those who can't. Um, and, um, and a play about, you know, Stephen is, um, is a churchgoer. It is, a, it is also a play about the church. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I grew up within this environment. My aunt was one of the founders for the movement of ordination of women. Mm -hmm. And it was a really big debate within our family because my grandfather, who was a vicar, did not approve. Mm -hmm. And there have been many vic bishops of Chichester who do not approve. Mm -hmm. um, so that, kind, that context, I, I thought, was fantastically beautifully done. But what I thought was so brave, I mean, Alex Jennings' performance is astonishing, as always. Um, but David is a very flawed man. Mm -hmm. So there isn't the clarity 
that there is a racing demon in a way. Yeah. For example, many of you will have seen David Hare's Racing Demon when it was here in the, the late 90s, that there is the kind of modern version of the church and there is an older version. This, I thought, avoided all of those absolutes. Yes. And they're such clever characters, both the new younger vicar and David. Yeah. So is that all um, within the script that you had on day one? Or did actually the characters who are so well drawn start to slightly push those boundaries when, when you were in rehearsal? Well, the play, the first draft of the play came about three years ago. And the first day of rehearsal of the play was in March 2020. Um, oh, and that was, the, was yeah. the first and only day of rehearsal at the Bridge Theatre. <laughs> um, in the two years since we all locked down, yes, it has developed. Yeah. Characters have appeared and disappeared. New, new characters have arrived. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, um, the, the second, the curate, who you mentioned, has changed in texture and in and in um, but uh, and in um, uh, and in and his in his um, in the strength of his convictions. Uh, but that second vicar, the curate, has always been uh, has always been gay. Again, this is not a spoiler. Um, Stephen writes about. Um, that wing of the wing is possibly the wrong word. Forgive me, because I am not a I, I'm not a, a, a Church of England person. But he writes about that part of the Church of England, the Anglo-Catholic part, which is relaxed about the sexuality of its uh, of its clergy. Mm. Um, although he refers um, to um, evangelicals who are not in the Church of England, although um, I believe that. There are evangelicals within the Church of England who are not relaxed about gay clergy. No, I mean, it's the old, it's the old thing that actually yeah. the older tradition is much more tolerant than some of the newer branches. Yeah, actually. yeah. so that's, that's all, that is all there in the play. Yeah. There's also um, the thing that I thought was very moving because, and again, it never felt like a theme. None of this feels like yeah. themes. It just feels like people. The challenges of living in a very claustrophobic and small community where yeah. there are very definite haves and haves nots and the snobberies that go with that, but yeah. also the way people escape it. You know? yeah. And so drink is quite a big theme. No, not, not, yeah. I don't know why you laugh there. <laughs> <laughs> the bar is open, madam, um, or sir, indeed. Yeah. Um, but, but I mean, that is also, I think, a very, um, it's very moving because the play is terribly funny. Yeah. And then it's very, Plangent. It is. It is. And all of this, you know, there, there, there are all sorts of things in the play which seem very familiar to me. The church seems familiar to me. I'm, I, I, I've read English at university. I've spent an entire life uh, working with English literature, with English drama, English music. Um, I don't think you can be a student of English literature, English music, English history without being um, pretty familiar yes. with the workings <laughs> of the Church of England. Um, uh, and um, and I'm aware that um, that drink quite often lubricates um, um, again certain parts of the Church of England. This is this um, <laughs> Jews don't drink, so this is we eat, but um, <laughs> but we're, we're not big boozers. So this is this is not something I grew up with, but it, I've I've looked at it often enough to be able to be the outside eye on it. See, most of us had our first taste of alcohol um, sherry on a Sunday after getting back from church. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, uh, inappropriately young, possibly. Yeah. Um, but within that, that the kind of that um, arc within the play, that it is very, very funny. And mm. it's, it, there's a lot of laughs. Yeah. And then it's not that the laughs tail off because they become black humour. Mm -hmm. But that is, I found that painfully moving. Actually, well, my favourite, my absolutely favourite kind of play uh, is the kind of play that can switch in the blink of an eye between hilarious and heartbreaking. Um, and being able to, and, and I believe that, I, I love this play and I've loved working on it. And it has, an, uh, it has a cast of nine actors that are, you know, second to none that I've ever worked with. Um, Alex, um, I think he thinks, I can't remember whether it's 13 or 17 times we've worked with each other. Certainly um, we've worked with each other more than I've worked with any other actor and more than he's ever worked with any yeah. other director. So obviously I think he's the bee's knees. But um, this cast and this writer, I hope you will find that you're laughing one minute and um, in tears the next. That's, uh, it, it, it's what Chekhov does. 
Um, mm. And it's what Shakespeare can do as well. And it's what the best of contemporary dramatists do. My, the, the dramatists that I've worked with most, Alan Bennett, he does that. Um, and there is something about the texture of Stephen Burrowsford's dialogue, which reminds me of Alan. I mean, it, it, Alan has never written about uh, the southwest of England, but in the way he can uh, write memorable epigrammatic dialogue and yet still make it feel spontaneous and natural. He has, he has something of, um, of Alan um, and, and has, when he was an actor, um, uh, he was an actor for a, for a good few years before he, before he started writing. He was once in 40 years on. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it loops around again, yeah, which of course, yeah. Stephen Fry was in 40 years on here yes. on this stage in yeah. the beginning of his career. But it's, it's also that sense, isn't it, that every single emotion that we could feel as human beings can be contained within this space. Oh, yes. You know, massive emotions, yes. as well as really trivial emotions. Yes. And, and there's a lot, of, there's spite and there's jealousy and there's rejection and there's love. Yes. Um, when you were in the rehearsal room, did you, or your company, did, was there ever a discussion about what everybody's, where everybody's sympathies lay? Because when I came out in the interval, a lot of people were talking about, do you think he's right or wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, that it, people wanted to kind of be on Team David or not. Mm. What we, what, yes, there was, there was a lot of that discussion, I think. And, and there was a lot of discussion with, I mean, two priests in particular helped us and many more helped Stephen while he was writing it. Um, uh, uh, both priests said, well, I'd give the balloons, but I totally sympathize with the vicar. Yeah. I totally get him. And that feels about right. Yeah. I, think, I think what we hoped for, and again, you know, I'm not giving anything away because the balloon issue comes up so quickly in the first scene. Um, uh, I think our ideal would be that we can make people sympathize with this individual while disagreeing with the stand that he's taking. Mm -hmm. And understanding that even a man as rackety and flawed and, and unpredictable as David Highland, the vicar in this play, might want justifiably uh, to draw a line in the sand here. Mm. It's kind of almost random line in the sand. And maybe there's something, there's, well, I think there are a lot, other, a lot of other things going on in his life which makes him not budge from uh, this position, I'm, I, you know, things change, so I'm not going to, but, but that is, that's where he's at in the first half. Um, uh, and I think that's what, that, that's what we, all, we all wanted to do. I think to the degree that it would ever, mm. uh, such a decision would ever come our way, yeah. we, like the two vicars that mm. came and helped us, um, or both of whom had been through similar situations, would have um, yes, but would, 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 would have allowed this poor grieving mother what the hell she wanted at her little child's funeral. And, but yeah. you know, on the other hand, um, say I'm a, it, I, 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 I can personally sympathize to the point that I realize that I, as an individual, simply don't care what happens to me after I die, except I thought at the end of this rehearsal period, Actually, I kind of would quite like uh, a rabbi to say Kaddish over my, uh, not that I'll have a grave, but I would quite like someone to say Kaddish. Um, nothing, nothing that had ever occurred to me before. Um, That's so interesting. Yeah, because I, yeah, no, I get his point. I think that it's, it's, it's a dreadful ceremony that, that and, and we talked about the awful crematorium funerals we've all attended. Yeah. Um, and can see that. But this is, as I say, the MacGuffin of the play. It's not, it's not the centre of the play. But it, I, I hope that these kind of thoughts will occur. Well, I, I think that's why I think, you know, I, I sat there thinking this is a really great play mm -hmm. um, because it had the humour, it had the poignancy, but also it had the ability to provoke thought yeah. and everybody thinking, well, what would I do if it was me? And as you say, most of us will never be in that position. Yeah. But it felt like, it is the MacGuffin, but it felt like a genuine... That, that was a plausible line in the sand yeah. for that man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope so. You know, yeah. I hope so. Um, I obviously can't say why I'm asking this question, but I am really 
keen to have an answer, yeah. <laughs> which is, as I was watching, I thought, how is he going to finish this play? Yeah. Was the ending that we have always the end? Always, always the end. That's, you know, because that was, it, it's really hard to know how to get out always, of always the end. that as a dilemma. Always the ending. And it also, it, um, and uh, there's, a, there's a marriage at the center of the play. Uh, David's wife, Mary, played by Phoebe Nichols, has as rich a life as he does. He has two daughters. Um, they've always existed. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the curate was, has always been in the play, but was once a completely different kind of curate. Um, there's always been a policewoman. Hmm. Um, and uh, the, uh, the Southbury family yeah. has always been represented in the way it is. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, the other members of the community have come and gone and we're left with, we're left with an incomer from London. Yes. Who's also, I mean, well, you'll see, she's, she's articulate. I mean, she's not an entirely sympathetic character, but she's. Uh, but you can see where she's coming from. Um, so, so I think that's that, that is. It's quite hard to get some playwrights to deliver. They mm. hang on to their work forever and ever and ever because they never think it's good enough. Mm. Um, in the end, I had to call him and say, "Just send me the play," um, <laughs> and that was quite painful for yeah, yeah. to yeah, let yeah, it go. Yeah. Yeah. But he's gone on working at it ever since. Yeah, and actually, the incomer, she is, she's a Miss Marple character in a way. Not that she's Miss Marple or a detective, but that kind of pivotal female character within a community who doesn't really belong with anybody, yeah. um, but is a driver of many things, you know, sort of, it, you know, involves herself in a way that nobody wants her to, you know, yeah. Yeah, all of that. You know, I thought, I thought again, I mean, I. There are nine fantastic performances. Yeah, I, I think, mean I everybody think they're all great. is. They're all great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it, even though it's obviously Alex Jennings is is the lead, it felt like an ensemble piece. Yes, yeah. yes, I think Which so. Which is really yeah. so. In in terms of the the process, sorry to use the ghastly process word, but you've been rehearsing um, in London, then yeah. you, you've come down here. Um, obviously, you and Alex and others have played at Chichester, and others are younger yeah. and new. What was the process of coming from the rehearsal room in, into this space? Um, did it feel pretty big to people? Because it's a lovely tight play. Yes, and this is, this is the footprint of the Bridge Theatre sta stage when we have it in Thrust in London. So which is why there's space. Yes, because you've shrunk the, up the main stage. It's quite, which I was worried about, but it is quite amazing how in performance without any lights on in the auditorium, that space disappears. Yeah. And yes, it's a big theater and it's a challenging theater this, but it's not, it's not, you know, I did show after show in the Olivier Theater, mm. uh, which has fewer seats than this, but feels twice as big. Yeah. So it's, um, so th th I, I think this is, I, I don't think anybody felt um, <laughs> that immediately that they were going to be defeated by this stage and and I think it 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 sits really well here and yeah, I'm yeah. delighted to find that uh, that the the, the Chichester Festival Theatre and the Bridge Theatre are so compatible. Yes um, well it's so. love because it is a world premiere and it's a co-production yeah, which, which is, is a fantastic yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, have you felt um, well not have you felt have you had any of our we have many clergy mm -hmm. in Chichester have any of them been coming in yet? Have well, we had we um, we had a, a a group of about forty. Oh my lord! <laughs> uh, at, the, at the dress rehearsal, um, in the hope that they would be influencers. But I'm not sure that many of them are on TikTok, so I don't. Know, <laughs> so I don't know how that will go. And it was quite funny because at the dress rehearsal we had the Church of England contingent over there, and the. Contingent of all my colleagues from the Bridge Theatre, London, the, the, the Metropolitan Sophisticates over there. And it was as if they were watching two completely different plays because they laughed at one bit of it and they laughed at the other bit. So there was kind of laughter and stereo. That's, kind of going. <laughs> that's so interesting. Yeah. But I mean, that is, that's the big challenge, isn't it? When, when a, you bring a comedy, it doesn't really get its breath until you've got an audience. Yeah. So were there things that didn't land that you were surprised about or things where they, people were roaring with laughter that you hadn't thought was so funny? How well, I, I, there's a lot that, there is a lot that is delightfully funny, funnier than we, they thought, than yeah. we thought it would be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the clergy, um, 
they were they were getting stuff that only clergy will get. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and they uh, um, and that that was delightful actually. And then one or two of them were a little taken aback by the language, but you know. Um, <laughs> Well, yes, yes. I mean, uh, Lee's language is... Yeah, they, yeah. It's, there's, there's, there, there are a couple of characters in it who, who swear because they would, uh, every other word. Yeah. But every now and then, um, uh, both, both the ordained ministers uh, swear, which, um, which Stephen assures me uh, is entirely true to life. Yes. And indeed... <laughs> one of the vicars who came to help us in rehearsal swore like a trooper, so I can absolutely guarantee <laughs> you. Yeah. But also, I mean, the, uh, the, David's reaction to the, the particular character that swears a great deal yeah. is part of why he is a good vicar. Yes, yes. And, and yeah. one of the things, obviously, that uh, it's uh, uh, one of the things that I discovered from talking um, to... Uh, to members of the clergy, is the kind of situations that they find themselves in mm. um, is really, it, it really quite eye-popping. Yeah. Um, they described, we asked them, have you ever been in situations like this? Yes. Have you ever come across young men like this? Oh, yes. One arrived at my, yeah, kind of almost yawning. One arrived at my doorstep one night at two o'clock in the morning with a machete. And, the, and I, th I think they, there's nothing that, um, that they don't find themselves dealing with. No. And one of these, um, one of these vicars said, uh, a line that has since relatively recently been incorporated into the play. He said, the point is, you live with this constant sense of failure. That's what it's about, yeah. failure. And yet, whenever there is a job satisfaction survey across the entire United Kingdom workforce, um, the greatest degree of job, job satisfaction comes from the clergy, <laughs> um, which is kind of wonderfully heroic, really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, these extraordinarily heroic men and women who, who, who are dealing with very often people at their most desperate, at their most miserable, mm. and at their most crazy, um, yeah. uh, always aware of how short they are falling. And yet, they are the happiest in their job. It takes a pretty special kind of person.